the land and I would like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'll throw to Sarah to introduce Emma as our guest presenter today. Um, and just a reminder that we do record these sessions. So if you're not comfortable with your face being shown, please just turn your camera off for the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks for joining us, Emma, particularly at the last minute. I We did have um, Tom Gauchy slated for today, but he's double or triple booked himself. Um, and so we're looking forward to hearing about the staying at home program from you, Emma, and I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am a dementia consultant with Dementia Support Australia, and I've been working on the Staying at Home program since it began with DSA. My background is um, registered nurse in aged care facilities, and uh, predominantly the last 10 or so years has been in the community space. And the last couple of years with DSA, I've been doing um, you know, behavioural support in nursing homes and community. And now I'm on this wonderful project because community is really where I flourish and love it. Um, so what I might do is if you're ready, Sarah, I'll just share my screen. If that's okay. And we've got a little um, presentation here to share. Does it like that? Hmm. Okay, this doesn't normally do this. Sorry about this, everyone. Chat amongst yourselves to take the pressure off. <laughs> I think we have. We've uh, we've done something to the technology today. <laughs> yeah, it's um normally when I do screen share, it kind of looks very different to how it looks today. But we'll give it a go and see how you we go. go. Let me know. Yeah. Okay. This is looking promising. Okay. Um. Now, can you all see that? No, we can see your um, file folder. Ah, okay, because it's up on my screen. I wonder if there's a delay. Are you using two screens? No, just the one. Um, let me just try opening it again and see. Well, you can see your mouse clicking on it, so hopefully it'll just start up. Yeah, it might be just a bit slow. Um, so I can see the presentation currently. So um, what can you see? Just my blank screen. Um, no, your, um, your file folder. The file still. <laughs> okay, I might stop sharing and try again because yeah. um, I can see the presentation and that's normally what I do. Um, and I guess failing that, you could always email it through to Sarah or myself. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's easier or not. Yeah, I'm not sure why this isn't working, but we'll have a little look and just try one more time maybe. Yep. Um. Yeah, unfortunately, we're looking at your email reminders. Yeah, okay. So you can't see that presentation at all. No, I'm no. sorry. Oh, what a shame. Um Email it okay. to me, Emma, and I'll um, I'll get it up while you start talking. If okay. You like. What's your best email, Sarah? Sorry. It's Caledonia at Caledonia. Oh. Sorry. C a C a l a d e n i a. Yep. At Caledonia, the same spelling. Yep. Dot com. Dot au. Dot au. Okay. I'll just shoot that through to you now. I'm not sure yep. why that's not liking that. Um, just bear with me and then I can just chat while you <laughs> go sure. through the slides. You're hoping for a relaxing time today, but it's, not going it's to all good. It, are you? <laughs> okay. So I've just sent that through now. All right. I'll pop it up as soon as it comes through. Thank you. might just try one more time you never know you're lucky in a big or medium city
Any luck yet, Sarah? Uh, no, we're still looking at your lovely folder of files and I'm waiting for that <laughs> email to come through. Yeah. So I've sent it to caladenia at caladenia.com.au. Yep, it shouldn't be too long. It you might through. be going through your filters. If you want to start um, talking, I'll, I'll just wait for it to come through. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Well, so basically I'm here to talk about the Staying at Home program, which is uh, a new federally funded program in partnership with Dementia Support Australia. Um, and as you know, we're in this stage now where we're seeing some wonderful new providers come on board that will support um, to roll this out in particular regions of Australia. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background to staying at home, um, just let me know, Sarah, when that comes and I'll stop chatting. Um, it's basically a care or wellbeing and respite program. Uh, we bring along, generally we bring along, depending on the venue, up to six couples at a time. So the primary carer and the person that's living with dementia that they may be caring for. Uh, that might be a husband, wife, partner. It might be an adult child caring for a parent. Um, uh, there's all sorts of combinations that we look at and sometimes we've had uh, groups of three where we've got a mum and dad and an adult child that come along as a group of three to get the information together um, but we'll have a little chat about the ins and outs of that shortly. Um, so with the Royal Commission, respite was identified as a core area of need so the findings from that uh, Royal Commission were that people are really underutilising respite and that carers really need respite, but they've got low confidence in providers to provide quality care. So uh, these people in the community have got all these days available, but uh, really not using the respite in the way it's intended, rather waiting for a crisis to unfold and then kind of uh, picking up what's available. So the recommendations were made for some early and fairly frequent access to respite care, which, you know, for those um, caring for someone living with dementia, it's really important that they get regular breaks. So this was identified in the Commission's findings. So what came about of this is uh, Hammond Care had previously trialled uh, the what was then called the Going to Stay at Home program, which is a week long intensive training program. And that initial program uh, was back in 2013 and it ran for about uh, five nights. And so the couples would come in for that length of time. The carer would have education sessions and the person living with dementia would uh, you know, do activities and engagement with staff on site. Now, since about a year ago, um, Dementia Support Australia has been uh, given the job of establishing this program in every state in Australia and we're currently a year into that uh, and currently what's happening as discussed earlier is lots of new providers will be supported by us to come online in their areas uh, and start running this program themselves. So hopefully we'll get some really great coverage across the nation to support those carers that are looking after people uh, living with dementia in the community. Uh, our, our real focus when we talk about it, uh, the need for respite is to do this frequently. We want people to start building their village of care quite early in the journey, get the person living with dementia used to accepting some care from others rather than waiting until they're in a crisis. Sarah, has that come through at all? Mm, yes. It has? Oh, great. I might head over to you then. Lovely. Yeah. Everybody Perfect. can see that? I can. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for doing that, Sarah. What no an worries. Sorry all. about that. That's all right. Um, so maybe if we can just go through, there's a screen there, probably slide three or four maybe. Uh, okay, yeah, so we've looked at the background. So basically the kind of participants we're targeting for the staying at home program, uh, they need to have a dementia diagnosis. Now, not everybody that presents for this program is going to have their diagnosis in place uh, because we know that that can be quite a lengthy period for some people. It can take, you know, six to 12 months of testing. So that doesn't preclude them from 
participating in that instance, you'd be looking at uh, determining what's the history of their cognitive changes, have we seen a decline over time, and we'd explore that more with the person, uh, the carer. So we certainly don't want to be excluding people if they haven't yet received that formal diagnosis, but we also want to ensure that we've got the right people and that we're telling them the right information, because if they don't have dementia, we don't want them to sit through a three-day education program on dementia. Now, these participants uh, ideally have no BPSD, which is just the acronym for behavioural or psychological um, changes in dementia. Um, they're living in the community and they have a primary or secondary carer. So, you know, we have accepted people into the program that live alone, but are receiving quite a lot of support from, say, an adult child or family member who's maybe struggling with some strategies. So they don't necessarily need to have that person living in. Ideally, they do because they're then able to kind of apply some of these strategies across the span of the day. As you can see down at the bottom here, we've got the Bradati triangle. We've just got the two, the base of that triangle there, which is just really, you know, people with no dementia is tier one uh, and tier two is where we're targeting for the staying at home people. So people with no kind of symptoms of distress or psychological changes. Now, having said that, what, what we found is it's generally people that have got some changes that are presenting for help because if everything's going smoothly at home, uh, people don't often see the need then for some education or intervention because they're managing and coping fine. So part of that assessment process is determining what's happening for them and how we support those people safely on site. Because often, you know, if they've got some anxiety or apathy um, or distress that's not too severe you know we can then have supported people with those sorts of symptoms it's just about getting the resources and planning in place for when they're at their stay uh, our average staying at home participant is male so about 61 percent of them have been men um, average age of 79 and 44 percent of them have got alzheimer's and obviously 100 percent of them are living in the community so that's just like a little background around the target group uh, we're really looking for people you know, post-diagnosis or a few years post-diagnosis that can kind of take themselves to the toilet if they're shown where the toilet is. They might need a prompt or a reminder and that's okay. Uh, but people that are still, you know, really kind of able to manage a, quite a few activities of daily living with minimal support. Thank you, Sarah. If we can go to the next slide, that'd be lovely. Um, program delivery. So I think we're up to about 25 uh, programs now. Um, really our focus is empowering carers. That's how we get to keep somebody living with dementia at home because what we know is if we have a carer that's under enormous strain and they don't have the skills or resources or per, uh, you know, personal resilience to cope with the demands of this job, uh, then that's going to lead to sort of maybe premature placement in residential care. So it's really about focusing on our carers and getting them the knowledge and skills and strategies they need. Um, one of our focus is on letting them know where to go when things go, you know, when things go wrong. So we do discuss service navigation, we um, make referrals to services if there's some behavioural changes. So it's really about steering them in that right direction. I think part of this program, what's really wonderful about it is just challenging that notion, that stereotypical notion of respite. So a lot of carers that we see coming into this space have not used respite yet because they haven't seen the need for it or they might be anxious about kind of handing over the person they're really caring for to someone else. Um, and so this is a really what I call a soft introduction to respite. So respite care is provided while the carer goes into the education rooms uh, and the person living with dementia goes and does activities in the community or the house. If they have insight and want to talk about the changes that are happening for them, we do that one-to-one -one in conversations. And on some of our groups, we've had, say, three general gentlemen all struggling with the loss of their license. So we've just done like a small impromptu group talking about that. So that option is there for the person with dementia to also receive some education at a level that's appropriate for them. Because often what we see is people with dementia, you know, they get sidelined and um, uh, people kind of focus just on the carer, which is really important, but this person's actually living through this diagnosis and needs a space and time to kind of say, oh, this is really hard for me. So we do provide that as part of the program. And what we see with the 
program on this two night, three day stay is just this beautiful informal support group develops between the carers and the people living with dementia. So they'll often go away from the program and they'll meet up. They, might, they actually make friends. It's really lovely to see. Um, you know, what we see in this group and, and you guys would see it quite a bit, is that social withdrawal that starts to happen when someone's uh, got a cognitive impairment in a world that's not set up for people with a cognitive impairment. So they start to pull back from activities. They don't want to go anywhere or be put on the spot and be asked questions they don't know the answer to because that's quite tough on somebody's self-esteem. And so they tend to stay home more. Um, but what we all know about social isolation is it is as deadly as uh, some other health factors and um, smoking and obesity. So we really don't want our people becoming isolated. So that's one of the really lovely outcomes with this program that uh, the person living with dementia makes friends with other people. They remember what it is to socialise and they often go away and realise they've missed it. So we've had quite a few couples that said the program's really kick-started that reintroduction to social activities for their person, which is really powerful um, because we don't want the person with dementia isolated, but we also don't want carers isolated too. So if we can get them back out into the world, even if that's with the other people from this program, that's a, a really important intervention. And that just happens kind of organically. Um, it is a really safe environment too for social uh, socialising for the person with dementia. Obviously, the staff don't ask them questions that rely on memory. It's a very supportive uh, environment where we've kind of reduced unhelpful stimulation and and noises that might be distracting. So um, it's just a very safe space to, to do that. Um, I think probably if we can move on, Sarah, to the next slide would be great. Um, thank you. So our curriculum is really, it's, it's what I call an intensive kind of overview of everything you might need to know about dementia and how to support someone living with dementia. So our couples, the way we've run our program, and I'm sure different providers will have a different approach and that's okay. Um, our couples come in on a Tuesday mid-morning and generally head home uh, Thursday afternoon after lunch. That two night stay seems to be quite optimal for people. Um, we have meals together in the house and we meet back up for lunches and things in the house. So it's a really lovely, that soft introduction to respite because if the person is normally spending time with their carer 24-7 and then we separate them, we, we would expect to see some degree of anxiety or uncertainty when their safe person is, is in another area. So it's really lovely that it's in the same house. And if they become a little bit concerned, we can just poke our head in and say, look, here's such and such, they're just in here. Sometimes we've had the person living with dementia want to go in and sit with um, their carer and that's totally okay. The educator just rolls with that. Eventually they realise there's more fun in the house and come out. Um, but that curriculum is really supportive of both uh, participants. We look at things like, you know, what what is dementia? What are the different types of dementia? What can we expect from the progression of the disease? And how do we sort of get some plans in place now to deal with what's what's coming? We also have a really strong focus on ensuring the carer understands that the quality of care the person with dementia received is directly relation in direct relationship to how well they look after themselves and that's you know we see that a lot with carers they're very sacrificial and giving and they give and give and give to the point of exhaustion uh, and so we're trying to send them that message that unless you're in really good condition yourself this is not going to be um, easy to do so and that's not selfish to look after yourself it's selfish not to look after yourself um, so we focus on some strategies for self-care we look at ways that we can get some supports in place so that they can have some regular breaks during their week to look forward to as well um, we do discuss respite even though this program is really focused on keeping people at home with dementia we are a realist in the sense that at some point many people in their uh, the progression of their disease may likely need residential care. Uh, and we're very, very quick to tell people, carers, that is not a failure at all on your part. It's just that the care needs exceed what you can deliver at home or they exceed what can be sort of funded through services and everyone's got their limit and we're all different. So uh, I think, you know, with a program like this, it's really great to want to keep people at home and, and that's what we're certainly really enthusiastic about, but we also need to give carers the permission to relinquish the role 
when it's time for them to do so. So we do kind of look at how do we know when it's time for residential care? And then we also take them through some strategies to kind of um, make sure that that time is less stressful for both parties, because it's very, it's a very difficult decision for carers and people living with dementia to have to make. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. We have um, obviously the structured program and then during the evenings we have conversations with people and the staff where they might, you know, want to talk about something that's a little bit more private that they haven't wanted to talk about in the group uh, and that's facilitated over meals and during one-to-one -one conversation and generally we've got a specialist like a, one of our psychogeriatricians usually makes themselves available to come along and talk to clients um, about any concerns that they might have either in person or, or we can arrange Zoom sessions. So it's kind of a wraparound service where they've just got time to ask all those questions and um, you know just pause life because we do all of their meals. They don't need to worry about housework and cleaning. They can just come learn what they need to learn and, and know that their person is, is looked after. Um, Sarah, I might get you to change slides if that's all right, thank you. Okay, so this is um, one of the pictures from one of our first, our very first programs down in Horsley where we were lucky enough to get access to a residential, brand new residential respite cottage with beautiful mountain views. Uh, during this program, and I might get you to slide to the next one, Sarah, please. Thank you. Um, some of the outcomes we're seeing are really promising. It's, it's really early days, of course, but um, carers are, reporting back to us at our follow-up calls how it's changed the way they look at things. So during our, our carer, we give them quite a lot of resources when they arrive. And one of those resources is our staying at home, let it go magnet for the fridge. Uh, and that seems to have really resonated with a lot of the carers around you know, pick your battles, you don't need to fight. Oftentimes, you know, we're looking at changing a carer's approach where they might be trying to correct the person with dementia's uh, facts or uh, information and that's leading to conflict and erosion of self-esteem. So we do hear back from people that they realise, I've just got to let a lot of it go. Uh, and we teach them the battles that you must fight for are the things that are around safety and, and life-threatening risk, but you don't need to probably correct them on a historical fact. So uh, we're hearing that feedback early that carers are actually having a mindset shift. Uh, there's that peer support network that's being built. Um, and we're also sort of seeing people, it's quite different for everybody depending on where they're at, but one of our gentlemen, he came along and he thought his wife would never accept care from anyone. And he was sort of in his 80s, as was the lovely wife. And they were just struggling at home, uh, no help, adult children knowing they needed help, but he wouldn't let any of them help because they were working and had their own families. And she actually had a lovely time. She didn't even look for him. And I think he was a little bit miffed because, you know, they're so well connected. He thought that he was the only one that she would want. Uh, but she actually surprisingly did really well. And so he then went away and got activated some of the codes he'd already sort of sat on for a while for individual social support. And I think he had some flexible respite at the time. So sometimes that um, seeing that person in the house be okay while you're in another room kind of builds the confidence of the carer to go, you know what, I I'm not the only person that can do provide this good care. So I think that's also really powerful. And for some other people, it's really just about affirming their decision making process. So most of these carers, you know, they know their person with dementia better than anyone else. Uh, they know the changes, they know what's happening, they know everything inside and out. And so sometimes they're coming along to the program to just go, am I doing things right? What could I do better? And sometimes for those participants, just coming along for us to kind of reflect back and go, yeah, you're doing a really great job. Keep going. That's wonderful. Boost their self-esteem and confidence. Because I think in the caring role, if you've got the knowledge that there's not much more you could be doing and that you're bringing everything to it, then you can kind of relax a little bit and not kind of beat yourself up about your caring role, which we know carers do. Um, do you mind swapping along? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so these are just some really initial early stats um, from a very, very small sample size. It's literally um, 
of our pre-program. So before we have participants come along, we take three formal evaluation measures. Uh, we look at their level of independence in the home. We look at their cognition on the global deterioration scale. And we look at the Zarat Burden interview for carers. So just, it's probably too early to tell from such a small sample size, but what we are seeing is a shift down, I guess, in categories. So if you have a, you know, we don't want to focus too long on it because it is not a statistically significant sample size, but this pre-program is before they come along to the education and the post-program is at our six-week follow-up where we repeat that again. Um, and you can see that potentially there's a shift in some of those categories where people are moving from, say, moderate to severe to mild to moderate burden. Um, but we, it's too early to tell the outcomes yet. We need a much bigger sample size um, to determine what the outcomes will be in the face of a progressive illness. So once all that data's out, we'll know a little bit more. Uh, but we are tracking it, as probably you guys will be too. Um, Sarah, do you mind just sliding along to the next one? Thank you. Okay, oh, this is a nice story um, about Sandra and Mary. So Sandra uh, was caring for her mum, Mary, and she was doing a really great job as a primary carer. So she was trying to manage her own household, you know, husband sort of uh, university age children and her mum was living independently in the community, but she was doing quite a lot for her mum, but was kind of agonising a little bit over what she was doing when it was really clear that she was actually doing an amazing job. But, um, and she was really respectful of her mum's autonomy and and right to make choices, but she just didn't want to step across the line. And there were also topics that they wouldn't broach together. Um, the mum, Mary, became quite defensive around Sandra's questions about the future and what do we do and do you want to go to residential care at some stage? Where do you want to go? And uh, Mary was really shut down to those discussions, which kind of left Sandra just wondering, you know, what am I going to do? How are we going to manage this when the time comes? Um, so interestingly, they came along to one of our programs and the mum, Mary, just opened up to one of our workers there, like just really loved the opportunity to speak freely, I guess, with someone that wasn't family and that wasn't kind of as emotionally invested. She could just speak really freely without worrying about hurting anyone's feelings. And she kind of just divulged all these fears that she had. And, and our um, dementia consultant just sat with her, worked through that process, kind of talked about, you know, if residential care is in your future, would you rather your daughter decide for you or would you rather be an active participant and go and have a look at some of these places now so they kind of went to that difficult space where the daughter and mum kind of tended to clash so they couldn't the mum and daughter couldn't have that conversation but having the worker come in actually really helped Mary to be able to just let all this out Interestingly, they sort of went home, they'd had a great time on the program. Uh, six week follow up, we get this feedback from the daughter that her mum's just had this transformation. So we're not quite sure what it was, whether it was just, a, you know, uh, divulging the things that had bothered her. She sort of brought these fears out into the light. But uh, it was enough that the grandchildren remarked on, you know, what's happened to Nan, she's just a different woman. So I think she just had this fear of the future and no one had had the opportunity yet to kind of say, well, let's just tease those fears out. Let's look at them one by one and let's look at scenarios, you know, because I think we have to be willing to go there with people that are wanting talk, you know, to talk about it. And I think uh, for her, it was more of a psychological transformation going, okay, well, if it's in my future, I can have some agency and I can go with my daughter. So they've actually been and visited a few local places and and having those discussions. So for them, it's been a, a quite a positive experience and the daughter's really appreciative of um, our staff being willing to kind of have those difficult conversations. Um, Sarah, do you mind just sliding through the next one if there is one? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so some of the feedback that we're getting is um, some of the role modelling that we're doing on the program that, that you'll be doing as well when you introduce your new program is really powerful. So the way that we interact with somebody or communicate with somebody living with dementia 
comes really naturally to us as health professionals and sometimes it's really hard to kind of nut out how we do things you know it's those basics of eye contact and making sure you've got their attention that the tv and radio is not blaring and we we do all that during our programs and we've always got really large visible name badges and so the carers get to watch how we do this um, so they can kind of mimic that as well when they go home because they get to see us doing that. Um, and it's really, I think that role modelling is really powerful with this program uh, that they get to see us chatting after hours, that they get to see us intervene when things might be going a little bit, uh, becoming a bit hectic or people are getting that cognitive fatigue in the afternoon. They watch what we're doing and how we're doing it and they take those strategies home. Um, do you mind going to the next one, Sarah? Thank you. Yeah, so I think some of the, you know, the, the feedback has been just overwhelmingly kind of positive around it. It seems to achieve different things for different people depending on where they're at and what they're needing. Um, certainly we do the six-week follow-up and six-month follow-up, but if we identify any needs at the program, you know, if there's some concerns that are happening at night that were not disclosed, say, at the initial assessment, uh, and that does happen because people only tell you what they're comfortable to tell you when they don't know you. Um, and you've got skills and you can draw information out but once you've spent a couple of days with the carer and the person living with dementia you can see some patterns and people open up to you and say well actually every night they're banging on my door wanting to go home uh, and maybe that wasn't disclosed before they came uh, but then we look at putting in some strategies and support so we do offer that post kind of program support and they know that they can call for any guidance or information obviously coming in for a two night, three day stay, they get a lot of information. They're not going to be able to kind of use all of that or necessarily need all of it now, but at least they've got some key contact points about, oh, I remember what to do when the behaviour changes or I remember this. And I think the really lovely thing about it, it is a very personalised program. If you can keep the numbers, you know, cosy, you do get a lot of that sharing between carers and, and people living with dementia. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Is there another slide? Yep. So basically, you know, the next steps, and I might just um, get you to slide onto the next one if that's okay, Sarah, is you can basically encourage people to register their interest through our website. So there's an expression of interest form there. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, the tender to keep rolling it out in states across Australia but where new providers will be coming on board and they'll have a footprint we won't be delivering services there we want to make sure we've got really great even coverage across the nation uh, that's something that's to be seen I guess as to where these new providers will will focus um, and then we'll just try to fill in gaps where there are gaps regionally as well but we do encourage people to register their interest we reach out to people once they've put an expression of interest in, we find out a little bit more about their situation. We tell them a lot more about how the program works and how it runs. And, you know, in our instances, we use uh, retreat style accommodation. So kind of luxury homes in the Airbnb market. So, you know, we need to know that the, the person's mobility and how they're going to cope. So we have that discussion with them. If it's not suitable for them, we suggest some other education um, formats that might work better for them but we'll be running programs nationally until June 2025 so there's no cost to the program as you're probably aware it's a free fully funded program so um, I think it's going to make a really big difference to to care or well-being in the community um, that's pretty much all I needed to say about staying at home obviously I'm fan of it I think it's do doing amazing things and we're seeing that word of mouth in the community as well where people come to a program they go home they talk to their you know care or support group and then we get all those referrals coming back through so I think it's um it's kind of a movement that's taking off where people are like oh I've got to get into one of those programs because it's actually a very unique program for those people that really need to sort of see things in action rather than just online this is a really wonderful format in which to do that it's like a little mini retreat as well so um, if you've ever got any questions you're welcome to call me through the Dementia Support Australia helpline which is the 1800 699 799 I'm always happy to answer any questions if you think of something that wasn't covered or if you if you've got a couple in mind and you're not sure if they'd be suitable just always happy to chat 
my personal thought on it is it's really good to get people to register for themselves if they can um, because it shows kind of a state of readiness I guess to have that information um, and and that they're ready and keen to come along there's nothing wrong with helping someone do that expression of interest but we really kind of need that buy-in from them right from the beginning uh, just so that we know that they're ready to receive this information and my I really do apologize for my cat in the background she does need to be part of everything that happens um, and so that's Suki the wonderful Suki in the background so apologies for that if anyone's got any allergies you can't hopefully be affected <laughs> uh, thank you Sarah thanks so much for being my um, tech support thank you Emma that was great very informative. My yes, thank you very much. Should we open it up to questions? Do people have questions for Emma? Yes, please. Hi, Emma. I'm um, Rachel from Dementia Australia. Oh, Just hi, a Rachel. couple of questions. Yeah. Do you have any yod specific ones of these or is it all for people over 65? Uh, so we haven't to date run any yod specific ones. We are looking at doing that. Currently, you know, we've had people with younger onset dementia attend in our group. When we've got people with younger onset dementia, we really don't want them to kind of be in a group of maybe late 80 year olds. Mm. Their needs are really different and unique. Often people with younger onset dementia, as you well know, we're, you know, some of them, their partners are still working and they're raising teenage children and they've just got a really unique set of needs. And so if we throw them into the wrong group, they kind of think, well, I don't identify with anyone mm -hmm. here. So um, to date, we've been trying to do fairly careful matching. If we have people with younger onset dementia coming to our programs, we've had quite a few, we always make sure that there's always someone else of the same gender or similar life experiences with younger onset dementia that we can kind of at least know they'll have somebody there that they'll have something in common with. We are looking at running specific groups though um, where there is interest for younger onset dementia that's certainly something we're open to because their their needs are really unique and I mm. think that that the challenges they face are, are very different to people that are retired and maybe facing Absolutely. this yeah thank you and one other thing what's the staffing like when you're there like what's so yeah, and who is do? the staffing yeah so our um, our staffing, we're, they're all dementia consultants. So, you know, they've got that behavioural background or engagement, like lifestyle diversional. So um, usually in the day we've got, it, and it does depend on the cohort. So obviously if we've got, um, you know, a group where maybe impulse control might be more problematic when we're out in the community, we might scale up staffing. If it's a maybe a more sedentary group that are happier to sit and do arts and things, we might be able to scale it down. So, you know, generally there's several dementia consultants working in the engagement space. We've also usually got a house lead who kind of takes care of the catering and just the logistical running of the house. And then we've got our educator and we've also got our dementia support worker. So they come in the day and they're there overnight. So we've got like a pool of people we can draw on and there's just that little bit of flexibility in terms of if we think this group might have, you know, uh, a need for more staffing, then we can kind of scale that up. And part of part of it is also making sure we we do limit it to six couples. Generally, the venues that we can find, you know, more than six couples would be a stretch to get a bathroom for each of the couples. But also just that sharing and intimacy in the education and social space I think when it balloons out to a big group then we're looking at a lot more noise and stimulation and people don't share as much so some of our programs have been smaller depending on the venue and, and the makeup of the group but um, our consultants when they do the assessment kind of get a feel for what this group is looking like and if we feel we've got someone uh, and they're not quite suitable for an upcoming program because maybe the, it's going to be a mismatch with the group we just wait list them and prioritize them for the next group in their area where it will be suitable because we yeah, want them to you. have a good time yeah, yeah and not, thank you. not feel out of place nice question. Hi, yes regina yes hi Thank Hello. you, Emma. that was great. Um, Emma, just wondering, so I take it that you run them all around different places, the, the, the groups? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've pretty much, we've covered every state in Australia so far. Um, so we've had a, foot, a small footprint in some states. Um, we've been to WA, Northern Territory, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania now. So with the new providers coming on board at there the moment, can. Uh, they will be kind of maybe taking over uh, some air, particular geographic areas. So we would withdraw from those spaces so that, you know, we're not in a competition. We're all kind of here to support one another to deliver this in an equitable way. So it's accessible for everyone across Australia. So uh, once that's been established, we'll just kind of, um, you know, plug any gaps where maybe there's not programs running. But it is it is across Australia. And when people register their interest, uh, if they're found to be suitable, we just pop them on a wait list. Yep. Uh, and then when we're filling a new program, we go to that wait list. And we generally, with that approach, haven't had to kind of uh, do a whole lot of external marketing because we've usually got a bunch of people just keen and ready to go. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. Thank you. Thanks, Regina. So Emma, as you um, alluded to, Caledonia was one of the um, is going to be one of the new organisations running the state home program in the outer east of Melbourne. Do you know who the other provider? I haven't seen a list of who the other providers are or what area they'll be covering. Hasn't been publicised yet, but I imagine that it's not going to be too long before we know okay. who's who and, and where they are. Yeah, but I don't. Uh, that's not publicly available yet from the Department of Health. So they'll, I imagine they'll issue something fairly soon so we can kind of plan. Other questions? No. no. <laughs> um, I was saying um, to Emma much, much earlier, before we started that I've been lucky enough to go out and see one of the staying at home programs um, running at uh, Dixon's Creek last year. Um, and then I drove up to Dalesford and, and was lucky enough to join them for a day um, at, at the one running at Dalesford. And the model, I think, choosing these lovely Airbnb venues is just such a, a pampering experience I think it's along a treat with isn't it the education yeah. and everything else it has a lovely a really lovely feel uh, when you visit these programs it's different to you know popping into the local library for an education session or or anything like that it, it just had a really lovely feel so we're looking forward oh, to that's it good. yeah I think you'll really enjoy it I, I think you know for me uh place and like in physical environment is really wonderful in setting this scene and look not all providers will probably run with that model and that's okay but it's just really about focusing on like those creature comforts making it feel home-like and having some ambience and you know having nice smelling foods and you really want people to just relax and be kind of feeling like this is a bit of a treat so I think um, you know what's been really lovely for me in some of the programs we've been to um, we ran one up in Mullaney which was in this gorgeous you know hinterland town and I'm from New South Wales but so it was a bit of a treat for me to go there but we took all our participants to um, the botanical gardens and a bird avery the ones that wanted to go with all the macaws and things and so they came back with all these great stories and photos uh, to show their carers and the carers were all really jealous about they'd been stuck in this education room and we'd been out having a great time but it was just really lovely because at the end of the education sessions around 4 30 they all came back together in the house and um all the couples went off for walks together down the main street. They went and had a little coffee and looked at some of the shops before they shut and then came back for dinner. So it is that kind of, uh, I call it a circuit breaker for people, this program, because it's really just getting, you know, two to three days where life can just pause and we'll feed you, we'll, you know, everything's kind of taken care of, we'll give you the knowledge and um and you can just really stop and reflect on how you're doing things and how you might want things to look for the future. So I do think sometimes it's hard to do with the busyness of life. You just get into that drudgery of your routines and continuing to go. So I do think that beautiful environment and that pausing of most of your responsibilities is really powerful for people to do some of that reflective thinking they need to do to kind of uh, plan what they want the carer role to look like for them. So 
yeah, for me, place is everything. You know, that environment's really important. Erin, hello. Hello. <clears throat> I do, um, I'm lucky enough to do the care support programs um, for Caledonia and it's a, they're mm -hmm. wonderful people. I just wondered if you find that, um, or if you know, if any of the carers form ongoing relationships with um, the people in their group when they've been away together. They and do. If they, yeah. if they do, and I'm sure they probably do, um, is that facilitated or is that just organic and they and they meet up on their own? So today, so today to date, it has just been organic and driven by them. So we provide, I guess, the forum and the scene for them to meet people and make friendships. We um don't mandate sharing of details, obviously, because not all personalities get along. But we do say in our sessions, you know, lean on each other if you can, because you're both going through different but very similar journeys. And, um, you know, some of my groups, so I had a, a group in Northern Territory and they all in the sessions, you know, created this WhatsApp group where they all connected with each other. And they're actually, because a couple of those gentlemen were experiencing social isolation. So they, they've since met up and gone on like a little picnic in a park together. Um, some of our couples in Tasmania, they like two men really hit it off and played snooker. So their wives have gotten them together and they've gone and done things. So that's all happening organically for them. Um, we, we sort of haven't needed to do any behind the scenes, anything except, you know, just that encouragement and, and at the follow up. So I guess it comes down to people's capacity you know, as you know, everyone's at a different point in their caring journey where maybe taking on a friendship might be too much, but for others, they might be just really eager for it. So we kind of let them drive that, I guess, but we do encourage the encourage that where they can, because it's really powerful. I think it reduces the carer's sense of isolation to know that we're not the only two at home going through this here in this room alone. There might be five other couples all having their struggles. And we do sort of say, even if you can't get together, if that's too much, maybe just think about picking up the phone and saying, hey, just touching base, how are things going? Because I think that connectedness is, is what we really need to see for these carers that they don't get isolated in the community. We have um, a yod group that oh. started online and um, so they meet online once a month and they meet for lunch once a month. So every oh. fortnight they get together. That's and wonderful. as we left lunch last week, one of them said, this group has saved my life. Oh, I know. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And what they talk about when they get together is everything, everything from what's the best kind of incontinence pads to use or, you know, challenges that they've had with their partner to conversations about, you know, how do I vote with the voice? Um, oh, when my brother came out as gay or transgender or, or whatever and um, how that impacted their lives, it's absolutely everything. They're a completely open and honest and tight group. And I believe Sarah will, um, if I'm wrong, they've only been meeting for about a year. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. And to be part of being able to create something like that, it makes it really easy to get out of bed every day and do your job, doesn't it? When you see just that the life changing impacts those sorts of groups have. And, you know, we've got a lot of people that talk about being part of support groups and what that it, it, they do describe it as a lifeline, um, you know, and there's a real place for that. And I think it's, we always get really focused on a person's diagnosis of dementia, but they're just people like you and me, they just have a disease and uh, you know, they don't want to always talk about dementia. They can if they want to but it's not it's not everything about them it's just a part of them so it's really lovely to hear of groups you know talking about all sorts of things from their brother their relationship you know that's yeah. we're pack animals we're designed I think for that social connection and we just see when that breaks down how negative the the outcomes are for people so yeah that's beautiful yeah Well, thank you very much, Emma. My pleasure. Um, Thanks for having me. It's, um, it's, it's such a good program. I'm so glad you were able to tell us about it. Mm. Um, if people want more info, that link was there. Um, and, Emma, did you want to put your email address maybe in the yeah, chat? You, yeah, sure. Um, or people can just contact me and I'll pass it along. I've got Emma's email. Um, if you've got anyone in mind in the East... Um, our program will be starting in the next month or so. So we'll be able to also start that wait list 
process and, and that assessment process, which is really exciting, very, very exciting. It is. It's, um, you know, it's a big job to do. Like it's, there's a lot of moving parts to these programs. But uh, I think when you've got people that are really enthusiastic about making a difference in this space, all of those obstacles, you, you overcome them because you've got this shared purpose about what you're trying to achieve for people. So it, everything is doable. Mm. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're here you know that we're here if you need anything absolutely <laughs> thank you thank you very much okay thanks, thanks for Emma. having me well look i'll leave you guys to the rest of your meeting and um just reach out if you've got any questions i'll pop my email in the chat there or you can call i'll also put the dsa helpline number you can reach me through that by phone um, and people can also if they're not internet savvy participants can register through calling the helpline they just need to mention the staying at home program yeah. fabulous Great. Lovely. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Well, I guess that wraps up our meeting for today, unless anyone has anything pressing they want to raise. No? Beautiful. Well, thanks for coming along. It was a nice big group. <laughs> all right. Nice to see you all. Thank you very much. See you. Bye-bye.